Can you put your right up here, sir. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Pat Patterson. I'm the professor here at the William J. Perry Center. We're very excited to have Mr. Billy Bernard Anson, special envoy to the Columbian Peace Talks here, to talk to us today. Uh, just a few administrative announcements before we begin. This is, uh, we're going to have an, an opportunity for the audience to participate in this uh, conversation via your four by six cards that hopefully you have available on your table there. If you have a question you'd like to address to Mr. Aronson, pass those to the outside of the room, and our staff will pick those up and pass them forward to us. The, um, the same is true for our online audience. We want to welcome everybody who's uh, watching this from downrange. We probably have about 15 or 20 countries from all over the hemisphere who are watching us today, uh, probably about two or 300 participants observing the discussion. So we're, uh, if, as well, for those uh, participants who want to uh, address a question to the special envoy, you can type those onto the chat room that's part of the, uh, the window and pass it uh, to us, and our outreach team will direct the questions to us. This is a real honor to have Special Envoy Aronson with us. As everybody knows, the Colombian peace talks have been going on for a long time, a lot of very contentious issues to address there. He, uh, he was selected in February of 2015, so about 16 months ago, uh, by, at the request of President Juan Manuel Santos, as well as uh, by President Obama and Secretary of State John Kerry, to be the special envoy to the police talks to help facilitate this discussion as we go forward on some really tricky issues in the region. He's got a lot of experience doing this kind of thing in El Salvador, Nicaragua, and elsewhere during his time in the government, and we're very excited to have him here talking about these topics. So, sir, on behalf of everybody at the William J. Perry Center, welcome to the, Thank you, welcome to the National Defense Thank University. We're going to jump right into the questions. Um, can you give us uh, an update on what's happening recently in the peace talks in Hungary? Sure. Um, first of all, I want to just acknowledge uh, my friend the DCM from Colombia and, and also my former military advisor when I was Assistant Secretary of State, Colonel Jay Cope, who was a great friend and good advisor during some complicated times in Latin America. But thank you for the invitation. Um, <clears throat> I was just in Havana and came back on Thursday night, is that right, Craig? Last week. Um, that's my 19th trip. Um, I came away more encouraged than I've been in a long time about the momentum toward final settlement. Um, the parties are focusing on three end of conflict issue. One is security for demobilized combatants, but also wider security against potential successors to paramilitarism or Bakrim. And that, that issue has largely been resolved, and both sides feel very good about what they've agreed on. Um, we can go into that in more detail. But And secondly, they're negotiating the terms and modalities of a formal ceasefire. As you know, the, the parties agreed on an informal ceasefire, but there are no boundaries or no observers. There's no monitoring. The two armies have done a very good job of staying out of each other's ways and trying to avoid confrontation. But that's inherently unstable, and we saw sometimes in the peace process last spring when there were actual very uh, destructive confrontations. So that'll be a formal ceasefire under UN um, oversight. And the final issue that they're negotiating right as we speak is uh, the terms of disarmament, or what the FARC calls leaving weapons behind, but a process by which the FARC will turn over its weapons according to a time schedule and certain modalities under UN supervision. There, there's still some issues that remain to be uh, negotiated even after those three issues are resolved. But, but if those three issues are resolved soon, and I think they will be, um, you can say that the, the war is really over in a serious way. Um, the parties probably hope to sign sometime in the next few months. I'm not, I'm not big on predicting the dates because you never miss, you never make your deadline. But, um, you know, I think things are, the momentum is good, the atmosphere of the talks is good, and the progress on these very tough end of conflict issues is pretty um, substantive. So, you know, I might come back next week and give you a different view, but that's where we are today. That's great news. Um, can you tell the audience so they have a perspective on how things work amongst the negotiations? How does it work in Havana? What, how do the, the teams come together? What fa additional facilitators there are? And it's, uh, specifically, what's your role in that process? Um, well, 
unlike some new negotiations, such as when we negotiate and enter the war in El Salvador, there's no designated institution that is overseeing the talks. There's no designated mediator as the power to convene the parties and pr propose drafts. It's a more ad hoc structure that the parties developed and agreed on, but it works. And, you know, there's a table of penitentiaries on both sides, but also at the talks are the two representatives of the two host or guarantor countries, and that's uh, Norway and uh, Cuba, who can play a role of attempted mediation at times and trying to help the parties uh, find, find solutions. Um, there's a, a lot of technical people on both sides who do the drafting and do legal work and the like. And sometimes the parties will bring in outside experts as we did for the um, transitional justice issue where we had a, a team of three lawyers from each side as a subcommission working on the side of that very complicated substantive issue. And as far as my role, you know, people say, what is, what is the job of the, of the special envoy? You know, once the Secretary of State introduced me and then I made some opening remarks, they gave me my folder with the job description and I opened it up and it was blank. <laughs> so th there's no job description for what I do. Um, partly what I, and I'm there because President Santos and his government asked me to be there. I'm right. not a neutral. But I think I built up a trusting relationship with both sides. So sometimes I can help interpret one side to the other, or explain a political -ish problem that one side has or the other. Sometimes I can, when there's, the parties are stuck, I can suggest a new modality to kind of unstick an issue, like, like the uh, subcommission on transitional justice was an idea that I tried out on the government first and the FARC and then helped them negotiate the name of that subcommission and then help the government choose at least one of the members. And they're the ones who finished transitional justice. So I, you know, I'm sort of an in, in, uh, infield, uh, what's that term now I'm trying to think of? Utility infielder in baseball, you right. know, you're a little bit of everything. Great, so you, you arrived, you announced I'm here to help and you started working from there. Actually, what I did was um, I sat down with the FARC for the first time, and that was in 2015, and Miss Universe was Miss Columbia. And a few weeks before my meeting, Miss, Miss Universe had given a speech in one of her, you know, tours of the country, and they'd asked her what she wanted to do as Miss Universe, and she said, my most fervent hope is to... Um, contribute to peace in my country if I can. So the FARC, not being stupid, invited her to come to Havana to meet with them. <laughs> and the Miss Universe pageant, which probably was owned by Donald Trump at the time, um, said they didn't think that was a good idea for Miss Universe, so she had to say no. So so I arrived and the six commandantes were across from me. I was the first US official that a FARC leader had met with in 15 or 20 years. So there was a bit of tension. So I said to him, I know you were hoping for Miss Universe, but it looks like you're gonna have to settle for me. <laughs> so that's how we began. Great. That's a great uh, follow on to the next question. As a con in conflict resolution literature that requires some special skills, unique skills of firmness, diplomacy, patience, empathy, emotional intelligence. You've been doing this for a long time. What do you how do you approach these, these thorny issues when you're dealing with well, two opposing parties like this? I would emphasize some of the traits you talked about. One is patience, particularly a Colombian negotiation. I, I kid both sides that I think my friends in Colombia get paid by the word. So <laughs> there's nothing that's solved easily, quickly, or simply. Um, and you have to recognize that. You know, you're undoing or you're overcoming 52 years of warfare right. and all the distrust and pain and loss and violence and that was attendant on that. Um, and I think you also have to be able to understand the narrative of each side and not dismiss the narrative. 
you don't have to agree with what the guerrilla's narrative is, but you have to understand it and acknowledge some of the parts of it which may be legitimate. And uh, because if you if you if you come with a partisan attitude that you know you're just going to support the government and always dismiss the guerrilla's uh, viewpoint, you're not going to play any role that's useful. You're just going to be another mouthpiece. So. I think you have to have an ability to listen and and be fair-minded. Um, I think you also have to know what belongs to the parties and what an outside participant can and should do, because at the end of the day, it's not the job of the United States to come with formulas to impose on Colombians how to end their civil war. It's up to them to. To, to, to do that, but we can push and prod and make suggestions. And uh, But uh, you definitely need patience. Right. What's changed this time? This is the, we've been at peace efforts in Colombia for the better part of a half century, especially in the last couple of decades. What's changed now? Why the previous talks have failed because they, there was a lack of trust and they appear to be disingenuous on both sides. Has, has it reached a stalemate or, or the... That's a good question. I mean, in my experience, both in El Salvador and in Colombia now, um, at least one side has to believe that the future is not going to get better. Right. Better that both sides believe that. In El Salvador, if, if those of you who remember, um, the guerrillas launched this major offensive in uh, December of, uh, in October of 1989, and they actually held some territory in the Capital. They infiltrated about 25,000, 2,500 um, combatants, and they really rocked the country. And the military fought back and overcame it. And the guerrillas lost huge numbers of people. But I think it taught the guerrillas a lesson that the Salvadoran people weren't waiting to rise up in response, and and they were suffered a devastating military loss, even though it was a political victory, a little bit like Tet, you know, in Vietnam. But the, you know, the security forces carried out this massacre of the Jesuits and some of their attendants, and that shocked the U.S. Congress and the conscience of the country. And so there was a threat of cutting off military aid. So both sides were looking to the future. The guerrillas were looking at a future of further, further attrition. They'd shot their wad in this final offensive. It hadn't succeeded. And the military was thinking, you know, what happens if they cut off our lifeline? So right. both sides had an incentive to negotiate. In Colombia, um, I think the success of the last 15 years of both military and political action by the government steadily wore down the, the FARC and reduced their numbers by two thirds over a period of time. And I think, I think they rightly saw that the military option would, was gone. They were losing cadre by attrition. They were not a defeated army. They don't consider themselves a defeated army. But the future didn't look better for them. I think the government was in a stronger position than the Salvadoran government because there was no threat of cutting off military aid. They were not as dependent on the U.S. as, as Salvador was anyway. But the bipartisan support for Colombia was very strong. It was more a decision, you know, do you want to have this constant, you know, violence in certain parts of the country, which were, you know, maybe 1,100 municipalities out of 110 municipalities out of, out of 1,200. It was not all over the country by any means. So, so the government could have chosen not to pursue the peace, um, but I think they made a calculus that if they could bring peace on honorable terms, it would be better for the country. And, and I certainly agree with that. I think the other change that happened for the FARC that made them re-engage in negotiations was um, they looked around Latin America and they saw the emergence of many leftist populist governments with whom they felt compatible throughout the region. You know, whether including former guerrillas like the FMLN, even Dilma Rousseff, um, Mojica in, in Uruguay, Chavez, um, Correa, Morales. 
So as the door to armed struggle was closing on them, suddenly this potential door for electoral power to them appeared to be open, right? So I think the confluence of those factors, and you had a president of Colombia, I think you have to say, who was willing to very courageously spend his political capital on peace, knowing that that's a difficult, difficult uh, process and that you're gonna be criticized by all sides, but he really had a will to end this war through negotiations. And I think his, his decision is it's gonna be vindicated. Right. In El Salvador, the military, I believe, remained resistant to the idea of the peace accords. It was pushed upon them by the political uh, leaders. Is that the same in what we're seeing in Colombia? The military is still resistant to the idea of granting some sort of political legitimacy to the FARC, where the United States Department of State has declared a terrorist group? Um, I think the military has been very supportive of President Santos to its great credit. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Colombia has a long history of civilian control of the military. It's not a country where you've seen coup and threats of coups. It's a very professional military. And, um, and I think they've added enormously to the peace process. Several active duty and retired generals are at, in Havana helping to negotiate the accords, particularly ceasefire and security and disarmament. So I think that builds trust as well. But uh, the, the Salvadoran military suffered a different sort of result of the, of the peace process. There were essentially purged of <clears throat> what was seen as human rights abusers. So almost the entire senior officer corps was, was uh, forced out of service. So I think it was a very different experience for them as well. Okay. Might have raised more of their opposition. I understand. Um, there's some really tricky topics on the table in Havana, political participation and representation of the FARC, land reform, cessation of drug trafficking, accountability for crimes which has been the toughest. I know you haven't been there for all of these negotiations, but uh, is one of those- the, uh, the most of justice was the, the most difficult. Okay. Because both parties said that these negotiations would put the victims first. And, and I think they worked very hard to come up with a process of accountability that was centered on victims that met international and inter-American standards on the ICC and the inter-American court, but also were doable. You know, it's easy to erect the perfect system of justice and tell the parties to sign under that line, but that wasn't gonna happen. And the FARC said from the beginning, they weren't gonna be the first guerrilla group to negotiate themselves into jail, but they are subject to very strong sanctions. They do have an obligation to make reparations, they have an obligation to carry out sentences of up to eight years of a kind of hard labor. Um, so it's a compromise like everything else in the peace agreement, but getting there was long and complicated because you had to satisfy so many different constituencies, including international law and right. the Rome Convention and inter-American court jurisprudence, as well as Colombia's legal system and Colombia's constitution and the political realities in the country. Okay. Here at the Perry Center, we study these uh, transitional justice and, and conflict resolution issues quite uh, extensively. And we know that Colombia has had a long successful history of demobilizing other groups, some successfully, not some not so much. It, do they, do they do, and from your experience, does the government bring a lot of that experience to the table? Are they able to navigate through these tricky issues because of what they've done with the, uh, the M19 or the paramilitaries in the past? I think that that experience definitely makes them sophisticated about the subject. I mean, Colombia has demobilized more guerrillas and powers in the last 25 years than probably any country that I can think of through a legitimate process. I think about 52,000 people have gone through their demobilization institution. Um, and certainly the example and the lessons they learned from M19 are applicable in some places to the negotiations with the FARC. So it, that history definitely informs the process on both sides. Right. And your experience doing this in El Salvador, you, you, have you brought, you've obviously brought a lot of that, that to the table in Havana. Anything in particular that you're, you've been able to, been able to use, you could cite for the, 
conflict resolution specialists who are watching this uh, process closely? Well, I think you need, if possible, to take advantage of or erect structural deadlines, not just picking a date and saying we're going to do it by that date because there are no consequences if you fail. But in Salvador, for instance, in order to enact constitutional amendments, you needed the vote of two successive national assemblies. And during the negotiations, the current National Assembly was going out of office, I believe it was May 31st, uh, 1990 or 91, I can't remember. But if they didn't pass constitutional amendments in that National Assembly, they'd have to do it the first time in the next one and then wait to the next one, it would have been four years, which mm -hmm. would have been impossible to sustain. And frankly, the, the then UN mediator was trying to amend the constitution, allow them to make resolutions or, or constitutional amendments to one national assembly and short circuit the process, which created a firestorm on the political right in uh, Salvador. And my view was use that deadline to get the parties uh, at the 11th hour, as, which is what they did, make the first uh, constitutional amendments and then they were able to do it in, this, in the next the next national assembly which started you know a month later but there haven't been some such structural deadlines in in colombia which i think has made things harder actually because uh you know it's human nature to leave the, the hardest issues to the end kick the can down the road and i often say that you know salvador if you had shown the government and the guerrillas the peace treaty that they finally signed at the beginning of the process, they never would have started in the process. And I think the same is true in Colombia because you wind up doing things that you said you'll never do, both sides do. Mm -hmm. And that's part of what the process is designed to do to get you to that point. So having, having deadlines helps get people to make very hard, politically difficult choices and not having deadlines means the tendency to procrastinate or kick the can down the road can take over. Almost a forcing mechanism to Correct. reach a deadline. Correct. Uh, I have a question about reintegration. This is a concern by a lot of people. How do you take a FARC militant or an insurgent who's been living in the jungle from a young age, knows nothing other than uh, warfare? How do you take somebody like that, demobilize him or her, and then reintegrate them into society to make them a contributing member of a community? Right. That's, that's a big uh, challenge that remains if and when the peace right. accords are signed. All right. Well, that's a place where fortunately Colombia, as I said, has enormous experience. They've demobilized 52,000 combatants from different armies and guerrilla movements and paramilitaries over the last 15 or 20 years. They have an institution that is uh, established for this purpose. They, they provide literacy, they provide job training, they help People look at alternatives and uh, you know for for work. Um, there's some social services involved, re re reunification with families, um, and the track record is is very good actually, in terms of not having people who went through the process um, go back to some kind of violent livelihood. Um, you know, it'd be an open question to see how much the FARC really wants its cadre to go through those processes and potentially lose them. Right. And that'll be something that the sides will have to negotiate out. But um, I have a lot of confidence in Colombia's proven record of reintegration. And, and I think, it, you know, you can't guarantee that everybody will follow the same path, but um, and I also think the government's very effective um, efforts to take down these backroom and these successors to paramilitarism like Clan Usaga will give some confidence to the cadres that wanted to mobilize that they will be able to do so without danger to themselves as occurred in 85 when the FARC created the UP and there was a lot of assassinations and the like. Right, the organized crime problem is a, is a serious uh, concern. Just uh, for everybody's information, just two or three weeks ago, they announced that they were going to launch airstrikes against uh, Bakreen groups in the northwest of the country. So it's a pretty serious problem. And right. hence, and it's a big issue at the bargaining table. 
because the FARC sees these groups as a threat to them. They want to know that, uh, you know, there's a real effort to take them down and dismantle them and jail them and whatever you need to do to just to mobilize them. So I think the president has proven his will on this. And even if the FARC didn't exist, it's a good thing to take down these Bakreem. I mean, they're corrupt, violent, dangerous actors. Right. And just a reminder to the audience, if you have questions that you'd like Mr. Aronson to address, please uh, fill out your, your cards, pass them to the outside of the table. But I'll continue with another another question about the uh, demobilization, reintegration of these uh, these insurgents. The cocaine uh, industry in Colombia is still a very serious matter. And from 2014 to 2015, according to UN statistics, there was an increase in cultivation by 40 percent. Uh, it remains a very lucrative and seductive uh, attraction for uh, these individuals who've been drug traffickers for a long, long time. That was one of the discussion issues on the table. What's, can you talk about the, that problem and how we can draw uh, these uh, criminals away from a lucrative industry like cocaine trafficking? Um, well, it is a huge problem. And uh, all of that drug money is a huge source of violence in Colombian history it has to be dealt with. Um, I, I would, and the production is up, and that's a great concern to the Santos government, it's a great concern to the U.S. government. But I would note as well that their seizures of, uh, of illegal cocaine after it's been made into paste and the like and packaged up are also at a record high. Great. It isn't overtaking the production, I don't want to give a false, but in terms of the government's will and ability to take down traffickers, they're really having record seizures this year, bigger than ever before, by a large margin. Um, you know, under the agreement, the FARC has to sever its ties with all illicit activity, cooperate with um, manual eradication, crop substitution. Um, and this will be a test of the, the post-conflict implementation of the agreement, really, whether it's whether the government can effectively go after this new production while they continue to go after, you know, the uh, through interdiction. But um, the U.S. is very supportive and they've put together a plan with five pilot programs of eradication. They're stepping up interdiction. And I think that uh, the government is very focused on this. Great. Yeah, that was uh, one of the questions that uh, a lot of us have brought up is that whether or not the FARC leadership, the sec members of the Secretariat, have enough control of the lower echelon officials in an irregular army like the, the FARC. If, if we agree to a peace accord at the highest levels, can they implement that uh, effectively right. through the ranks? Well, they say they can. They say that their troops are very disciplined and that they practice a kind of democratic centralism that when an order's decision is taken by the senior leadership that the ranks will carry it out. Um, they are going out in a, with permission to their cadres and their fronts to educate them about the peace process so they know what's coming and try to build support. You know, you can't guarantee that some elements of a front may not hook up with traffickers that they already are dealing with or work with the ELN, become traffickers. But I think that there will be a, a window that the government can occupy whereby we're in the areas that the FARC stops being involved in trafficking and production and the government can move in, but it has to move in, you know, not just with an anti-narcotics program, but with a program of government services that have not existed in those rural interior areas where there's no security, there's no schools, there's no education, there's no transportation, there's, Land titling is sometimes very imprecise. There are not roads to take alternative crops out. So it has to be part of a comprehensive rural economic development effort, which the, which the accords will call for as part of what they agreed to. Right. There's a question from our studio audience. A member in the audience is about the, the millions or perhaps billions of dollars of uh, funds that the, Clark, that the FARC has collected from drug trafficking over the past couple of decades. Uh, in the news, the FARC has denied having that kind of money, uh, but it seems obvious to anybody who's followed the Columbia history very long that they must have immense amounts of wealth stashed somewhere overseas or perhaps in jungle hideouts. Has that been on the table in Havana? Um, 
it's been on the table between the parties. I've not been involved in those discussions directly, but any funds or assets that the FARC has under the agreement would have to be uh, available for reparations. But locating them is more challenging than you might think. Right, especially if there's a level of denial about it. There's definitely a level of denial. Okay. Yeah. Uh, here's another one from the audience about the um, level of skepticism within the public, uh, within the society in Colombia. The, the talks have now gone for three and a half years. Initially, uh, people thought that the government announced that it would probably be done in a year. We were supposed to reach a uh, potential accord in March of this year. We blew right past that date. As, as this goes on and on and on, is there the level of, uh, of doubt is growing amongst Colombian society? And how does that impact the talks? Is there a sense of urgency amongst the, talk, uh, the, the members in Havana? Yeah, those are, those are all good questions. Um, there's a couple of dynamics at work. One is that large parts of the country are no longer affected by the war. Mm -hmm. Most municipalities are not affected by the war anymore. And so in, in areas where the security is okay and you haven't seen the FARC for a, a decade and nobody's kidnapping your sister, people can wonder why are we negotiating with these people? What's the problem? Interestingly, the greatest support among Colombians is from the people who lived in the conflictive areas and have suffered the most from the war. Mm -hmm. You'd think it was the other way around that they would want vengeance only and just you know, take out these guys, but they actually are the most supportive. But I also think, as you said, that, you know, we've paid a price for how long these negotiations have taken. If you count the secret negotiations, which were preparatory to create the framework for the formal talks, they've been at it for more than four years now, I think. So, and I think it's difficult for people to get their hopes raised and then they get taken down and they get raised again, they get taken down after a while, people don't want to keep in, get investing in the process. But having said that, um, well, first of all, I should say, I think it's to the credit of President Santos that he is going to put this entire agreement to a vote of the Colombian people in a plebiscite and let them make the final decision. He doesn't have to do that under the constitution. He could just sign this peace treaty. I don't think any of the previous peace treaties were subject to plebiscite. Uh, yeah, so I think it's part of his strong commitment to a democratic process that he's doing this. Um, I believe that individual Colombians will say, I don't like this part of the agreement, or I don't like that part of the agreement, I wish it had been tougher here, et cetera. But when they have to vote up or down for an accord that will end the war with the FARC after 51 years and all of the suffering that's gone with it, I think that there'll be an overwhelming vote for peace. But it's not without controversy and there are political figures in Colombia who are making that their platform to oppose the agreement. And so that has an effect. But also, you know, Colombia is a real democracy and there are different views and that's a good thing, mm -hmm. right? If it was a Cuban plebiscite, we'd know the outcome. Let, let's go back inside the negotiations themselves in, uh, in Havana. What's the relationship between the government representatives and the FARC members uh, across the table? Imagine they came into these events, this, this kind of negotiation a long time ago, but very destructive. Is there a, a level of uh, civility and cordiality? Are they uh, all working toward the, the same issues now? There's definitely a level of civility. I think both sides treat each other with respect and uh, never gets into the personal and all. People control their emotions, even if they may be upset about something. Um, and then I think when some of these subcommittees, particularly between the generals on both sides, or the equivalent command as a general on the Colombian side and the commandante or a member of the secretariat on the FARC side, who have worked very intensively over many months on a given issue like ceasefire or security for the mobilized combatants, you know, I think there's a kind of respect that has grown up in some instances, a level of trust. But, you know, the talks are like a roller coaster. You're, you know, you're taking all this time, you're going up, 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 and all of a sudden you're heading down again. So, you know, it, 
it's, it's not a straight line. It's not just each day has gotten better and better and better and we're all singing Kumbaya. But I do think that the two sides have learned to work with each other to a variety of channels that are effective. Um, I think the Cubans and the Norwegians have been helpful significantly. And, uh, and the negotiators have come to know how to talk to each other in a way that eventually leads to a result. So I think the process is working you know, the way it should. Okay. Let, let's talk about these guarantor countries. Cuba and Norway are guarantor countries. Venezuela and Chile are accompanying cu countries. Can you tell us, tell us about the role they play and how they're involved? Well, Cuba and Norway are the host country. So the talks, I think the first set of talks started in Norway, but for logistical reasons, obviously that was a long way away. So the talks take place in Havana. Havana provides all the facilities and uh, the, the, the the FARC has uh, houses in, a, in an area of diplomatic residences that the government owns and provides to them. And the, the logistics of the talks, the Cubans handle all of that. Um, and there's issues, you know, if the FARC co commandantes have to travel to Colombia, there's a, a lot of logistical efforts that the Cubans and the Norwegians help with. Um, the Norwegians have been very involved in the demining effort and working with a Norwegian uh, NGO on that. Um, and then they work as facilitators in the talks, somewhat like I do. Um, Chile and, and uh, Venezuela are much less formally involved. They don't have a representative at the table. They weigh in sometimes when there's a need to speak as a common voice, uh, the time when the talks were broken down and the four of them issued a joint communique asking the parties to come back to the table and that created a, a face-saving kind of umbrella under which the parties could both, both go back. So they play a role as well, but I think the dominant role is certainly Norway and uh, Cuba, right? among the four. Okay. In some sectors of the Colombian society, there's a lot of uh, question and doubt about the role Cuba's playing as a longtime sponsor of uh, communist revolutions and, and social movements in the region. Uh, there's questions whether or not Cuba is advising the FARC uh, just to continue trying to accomplish politically what they failed to do militarily. Has that been an, uh, uh, an obstacle? Well, it, it, to the extent to which that is going on, it's not visible. I mean, they have probably a lot of complementarity in their political views, so it's kind of natural that they would share that. Um, certainly with the Venezuelans, I think the FARC has a close relationship as well. Mm -hmm. And the FARC wants to get into FARC politics as a legal political party. But um, that's the point of the negotiations, to get them to give up weapons and to accept earning power through ballots. So I don't think that's a, a great worry, you know, You've seen in other countries, some movements come to office through legitimate electoral means and then compromise all the checks and balances and sort of rule as authoritarians. And I'm sure Colombia will be vigilant to not let that happen in their country. But um, I don't think, I think, like I said before, I think the Cubans and the Norwegians have been highly constructive in the process. Okay. Here's a question from our online audience coming out of Peru. There's a, uh, based upon the history in Colombia of La Unión Patriotica, the, the, the political effort in the 1980s for the FARC to demobilize, and many members were assassinated by uh, paramilitary groups. The, the FARC have mentioned that as a concern in uh, Havana a number of times. How do, how do these uh, groups who have fought for so long have this sense of peaceful coexistence as they're reintegrated into society? Uh, after the peace accord signed. Which groups are you referring to? The armed forces in the FARC? Or the or FARC uh, going back into a community, for example, that they've uh, perhaps conducted hostilities in before, even committed human rights violations, and perhaps a sense of vengeance, even perhaps from some rogue members of uh, ex-paramilitary groups or even members of the Colombian military who want to take a uh, form of extrajudicial... Right. Well, like I said, this was a huge subject of the negotiations and the, the government and the FARC said it said, set up a separate subcommission and headed by General Naranjo, who used to be the commander of the police. Right. And uh, 
a FARC member of the Secretariat named Carlos Lasada, Carlos Antonio Lasada, and they have um, reached agreement on a number of elements which have not been talked about publicly yet, but the government and the FARC will announce them when they make announcement on security. But um, I think the government has taken some very uh, important decisions about setting up new mechanisms to go after these Bakreem. They've demonstrated in the field with Klan Usaga that they're prepared to not just promise to do this, but they're doing it as we negotiate. Okay. Um, there's going to be a personal security component of that for the top FARC commanders. So I think to the extent to which you can bulletproof the, the mobilization process, they're trying to do that. But there's a lot of people who get killed in Colombia. Nobody knows who or why. I don't think that'll disappear from the country, but um, and I don't want to predict something that may not turn out, but I was always struck in Salvador that it was also a very dirty war, right. a lot of um, terrible violence on all sides, but there were really virtually no vendettas and no score settling. Nobody ever thought the war was going to resume after the process was over. Um, so I, I think it'll be okay. Mm -hmm. We'll see. Okay. Yeah, it would be, be helpful if all the political actors in Colombia, you know, supported the importance of uh, security for the, the mobilized combatants and taking down these former paramilitaries. It takes a very professional and disciplined force to uh, follow orders and avoid those kind of uh, actions that the, the country has. Yeah, really. I, I don't think the Colombian armed forces is a problem at all. Mm -hmm. They're more than disciplined, they've been part of the peace process. They're going to be part of the solution as far as security is concerned. It's much more the back ream and the traffickers and the successors to paramilitarism, the corrupt elements that do a lot of illegal things in Colombia, including uh, narcotics. That I think those will be the threats. Here's another question from the audience about apologies that have occurred. Uh, in December of 2014, the FARC representatives in Havana apologized for the uh, some of the, to a couple of the um, survivors groups that came forward to testify in front of them. Humberto de la Calle, who's the senior negotiator from the Colombian government, called this, quote unquote, enormously significant. Uh, the question is, is, is there a, a sense now of because of 220,000 plus victims in the conflict, 80% of which have been civilians, is there a sense of remorse? Is there a sense of uh, responsibility toward civilians who have been killed in the conflict? Or are the groups that in Havana just interested in maintaining their own, in, in furthering their own interests? Well, <clears throat> you can just judge people by what they do. Um, in addition to those apologies, uh, one of the senior members of the secretariat went up to uh, an area where there was indigenous people living that had been caught in the middle of a firefight between the FARC and some paras many years ago and the FARC rocketed the area and with mortars and they landed on a church and about 70 or 80 civilians, many women and children were killed. And this, this commander, Pastor Alape, went there and personally apologized. He talked about it at one of our sessions. And, mm -hmm. But um, but the FARC does not apologize for having waged a revolution. They believe that was just and needed, and they're not going to say what we did for 51 years was a mistake. That's, they haven't said that yet. I okay. think they will say it. But built into the structure of the transition adjustment, it's a truth commission and a, and a set of um, confessions of their crimes that have to be delivered to these judges if they fail to tell the whole truth of their on all sides, state actors too, but of uh, crimes against humanity or war crimes or violations of international human rights law, then they will be thrown into the civilian courts and subject up to 20 years in, in hard time in prison. So in, in, in the structure of the peace accords is confessions and apologies and reparations to the victims. That's okay. a fundamental part of it. There are also, in addition to those uh, human rights trials that you're mentioning, there's also going to be a truth commission. Right. That will uh, 
pursue uh, promises of non-repetition and stuff like that. Can, uh, are you familiar with how that's going to work? Has there been a lot of, I know that's been one of the topics of transitional justice right. in Havana. They're still figuring out how they're going to choose the members of that, I think. Uh, it hasn't been, I haven't been too involved on the Truth Commission, just getting it, getting one set up, but the, the, the modalities of how that'll sort of work, it's in the processes and who will be the members. Um, I'm not. I'm not so up on right now. Okay. How about the United Nations peacekeeping force that's going to uh, come in right. and oversee the disarmament? Right. It's not actually a technically a peacekeeping force and under UN normal terms. It's not blue hats. It's a civilian mission. Though many of its members will be former military or active duty military. It was set up under the auspices of the Security Council, which voted unanimously to establish this. It's called a um, monitoring and verification mechanism. Okay. The UN Secretary General appointed a very skillful diplomat named John Arnaud, who set up the peacekeeping process in uh, Guatemala as part of the end of the conflict there. I think he's trying to recruit about 400 members They'll have hub offices in about nine cities in Colombia, but they will actually be in the field monitoring and overseeing the concentration of the FARC in the concentration <clears throat> zones, monitoring some of the traffic in and out, and ultimately monitoring the handing over of weapons under disarmament. Mm -hmm. That was a challenge in El Salvador. In fact, I, I think one or two years afterwards, there was a huge cache of weapons found by, uh, from the guerrillas. Uh, that's going to be a tough task, I think, uh, for just what's estimated to be 350. Well, I, I've told the guerrillas that they would be making a terrible mistake not to hand over every weapon because it'll be found and they'll lose any trust that they hope to build if they want to become a political force. How was that advice received? Um, they listened. Good. Okay. Uh, here's another question from the audience about the women uh, FARC members. An estimated 30 to 40 percent of the FARC are females. And uh, how are they going to be reintegrated into society? They have a different uh, aspect of perhaps stigmatization and, and other problems. Are they, are they have, been, have their role been discussed in the demobilization process in particular? Um, I think it will be built into the demobilization process. Um, I don't know that their role has been, I, I think they're just getting to, to the discussion of the specific modalities of demobilization right now. So that yet to be defined, but um, a lot of the combatant, I mean, the FARC has a significant percentage of its ranks that are female right. combatants, and it does pose extra sets of issues that have to be dealt with, family reunification and the like. But um, again, of the 52,000 combatants that the Colombians have already demobilized, I'm I'm sure that thousands of them were also women in previous efforts, including M19 and others. So I don't think it's a new problem, but maybe the numbers will be larger. Okay. Um, here's another question from the audience about the economic realities, uh, the price of oil dropping, the Colombian budget being uh, right. uh, having some troubles as well. As well. Has, have the FARC or, or the Colombian government uh, talked about the complications associated with a low economy? Um, well, yes, for sure. They, they're very cognizant of it because about 30% of their revenues, government revenues, depend on oil earnings. Mm -hmm. And the price of oil has, you know, dropped 65, 70%. It's starting to bump up a little bit in the last month, which is, which is good. But it does put extra pressure on the Colombian government as far as resources are concerned. You have a historic low in, well, not historic, but a significant low in oil prices, just when all of these needs to to uh, uh, carry out the implementation of the agreement are coming, you know, and have to be addressed. I mean, the United States under President Obama has pledged, uh, asked for the Congress to appropriate $450 million in fiscal year 17 to help with some of the funding. The EU, my counterpart from the EU just announced in Bogota two days ago that they're going to provide, I think, 540 million euros. Mm -hmm. And many individual countries are going to make commitments. The United States and Norway have also put together a group of countries, about 22 so far, called the Global Initiative for Demining in Colombia, where we're bringing in 
experts from all of the member countries. We had a very successful meeting in uh, Bogota two weeks ago, three weeks ago, Craig, three, four, three weeks ago. And we also brought them out to the demining sites in Orion. And we're hoping that'll be a separate channel for support. Colombia says it needs about um, 340 million dollars to demine. Is that right, Craig? 320. Um, and the United States in no way have committed 50 million so far. So we want to use this as another vehicle. But resources are going to be important. And, and I think it's particularly important for the Congress in the United States to recognize that this is a great success story, first and foremost for Colombia, but the United States played a significant role. And at a time when the conventional wisdom is that we cannot accomplish anything as a nation on a bipartisan basis, Colombia is a huge bipartisan success story. It started mm -hmm. out under a Democratic president and a Republican Congress. It's been sustained through successive administrations. Congress has gone to the Democrats. To it. Presidency went to Republicans. It's been sustained under over 15 years. And it would be a tragic mistake to walk away just when the ability to consolidate all these gains are, are, are on the table. So I think our Congress and hopefully other countries will step up to this challenge and opportunity. Okay. We're almost out of time, sir. And I just got a couple more questions, if we could, about the. Uh, here's a question from the online audience about the extradition policy. Uh, Colombia has had an extradition policy to the United States for a better part of 25 plus years. Uh, and now, as we understand, that's now been taken off the table. Is that formally off the table? Has the Colombian government agreed to that as part of the negotiations? Well, first of all, Colombia is there's no better partner for the United States around the world as far as extradition in Colombia. They've extradited about 2,200 people to mm -hmm. our country. <clears throat> we have an extremely close cooperative relationship between our judicial system and our DEA and FBI and others in criminal justice with the Colombian counterparts, and we, we value that relationship very much. Um, <clears throat> it's, most of the FARC leadership were facing indictments or are facing indictments from the U.S., mm -hmm. And just as they said they weren't going to negotiate themselves into Colombian jails, they were even less eager to negotiate themselves into U.S. jails. And as part of the transitional justice agreement, <coughs> the government agreed. I'm sorry. <coughs> Got a bit of a fog in my throat. The government agreed that for, for crimes that the U.S. has indicted the FARC, for up to the time of signing, mm -hmm. they will not extradite them to the U.S. Okay. They will have to go through transitional justice or criminal justice, depending on how they behave. Um, and the U.S. government has taken the position that we would prefer extradition. We recognize that this is a sovereign decision of a sovereign government, and they have every right to decide mm -hmm. who and how and when they will extradite their citizens, and we respect the decision they made. Okay. Last couple of questions. Uh, in your opinion, what's the biggest challenge? What's the biggest hurdle that's going to happen after, assuming a peace accord is signed? What's going to be the toughest uh, element to implement? Well, I think the toughest thing is that the, the peace process will have raised great expectations in okay. many areas. You know, this whole program of rural development and land titling and substitution of crops and roads, demining. Uh, restoring disappeared and the remains of disappeared to their families, um, the mobilization of the FARC, reparations to victims. That's all going to be suddenly on the table of the government as soon as everybody signs their names and the Colombian people ratify the agreement. And like we talked before, resources are tight in every government around the world, including the U.S. government. But Colombia, because of the soil issues, especially so. So I think it's very important, as I said before, that the international community stand shoulder to shoulder with Colombia over the next period of years to help in every way possible implement the commitments that have been made. So now. I want to make one last point about this issue, which is the, the, the commitments that have been made are, are not just the price of peace. They're good things for the country. Mm -hmm. 
you know, there's a divide in Colombia as there is in Peru, as there are in many countries in Latin America between the interior, the remote parts of the country and the cities and the government. And that gap, and President Santos talked about this, bridging that gap when he ran for president. That's a big commitment of the Accords. It's not a price you pay to get the government, the COFARC to leave their weapons society as part of the uniting Colombia and contributing to its development and making it even more attractive to investors. But it's going to take resources and commitment. And, and that's true of every part of the peace accord. That's why I think when people realize how many things are going to be done that are beneficial for the country, you know, to rid the, the country of landmines and allow that productive, that land to go back into production and to keep kids from stepping on landmines or, or livestock, that's a huge benefit for the rural population. But everything's going to take commitment, energy, money, time, and, you know, this has to be a global uh, effort. Right. Rural development is, uh, in particular, one that seems to get a lot of attention from the audience about uh, the efforts the Columbia government has had in the past to, to de develop a, a presence in remote areas. And uh, that, uh, that's something to, to be a significant challenge for them in the future, I believe. Absolutely. It's part of the roots of the war also. You know, that there have been large, you know, Columbia's a huge country and its the topography is very complicated of these regions that are far, hardly, hardly can be accessible. And, you know, you can't have security, rule of law, development, education when the government isn't even a presence. And that's where the vacuum that the groups like the FARC and the ELN has filled to some extent. So mm -hmm. when those are open up again, it's very important that the government fill them quickly and keep the back room from taking over. Right and to bring these services that the citizens need and deserve. Okay, La last question, and this is, a, this is a pretty broad one from the online audience. What lessons can be taken from Colombia's peace efforts that can be applied to other countries who are going through the same process? And they mentioned the Taliban here, negotiations between the Afghan government and Taliban and others. Every case is unique. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but is there... Uh, something in particular that you'd like to, if you had to advise uh, another group in other countries uh, talking about this, that you would uh, that you pass to them? You know, I would go back to what you said. Every situation is unique. I, I wouldn't take me a long time to think about what lessons in, of Colombia would apply to the Taliban, to be honest. Okay. Because it's a very different situation. The one lesson is the obvious one, which is change the correlation of forces on the battlefield and you want to open up the negotiations. Right. Okay, great. So we're about out of time right now. I just want to before well, we... One other point. Okay. I don't know if this applies to the Taliban because they're, they're so fanatic and religious and it's all wrapped into a kind of theocratic view of the world. But at some point, you have to accept that movements and people can change. Mm -hmm. You know, Boris Yeltsin was once a member of the Central Committee of the Communist Party. He was the guy who declared that communism is over and dismantled the Soviet Union. So you can't sit down and negotiate if you think that your enemy is a demon and it's never going to change. You have to be wary, trust but verify, but you have to be open to the possibility that people can change. Right. And um, in my experience, people who've been in these wars, um, as a guerrilla in Salvador said to me, you know, they get sick of death. So maybe there's a possibility for something new that you have to be open to. Okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Uh, before we finish, I just want to take the, a moment to, on behalf of the director of the Paris Center, <laughs> thank a, number, a couple of individuals who've been very instrumental in putting this together. Mike Mann, who's our uh, Hemispheric Forum coordinator, has really worked hard to put this together behind the scenes. And the whole Paris Center staff, our outreach team, our information technology team, our team of research assistants who have been uh, passing uh, some great questions from uh, downrange. We do have another Hemispheric Forum coming up in just a couple more weeks on LGBT personnel in the armed forces. It'll be held right here in the Paris Center on 22 June. Please check our webpage for information on that. And most importantly, uh, Mr. Aronson, Special Envoy Aronson, I want to thank you on behalf of the director and everybody here at the Paris Center for spending time with us today. It's been thank very you. insightful about your, your efforts. I enjoyed it. It was a great time. So that was great. Thank you very much for attending. Great. Very appreciative. Great insights on what's going on.